All right, all this talk about the rally at Kempton Park it just brings to mind uh, all a lot of other fond memories about amateur radio and the UK. I guess my connection with UK amateur radio began as a kid. Um, I grew up in the in New York City and the suburbs of New York and got involved in ham radio, as many of you did, at, at the age of 12 or 13. And, you know, I can remember those early early days when I was uh, trying to make DX contacts. I, I have to tell you that among, for me, the most meaningful, among the most meaningful uh, DX contacts that I made were with, uh, with UK radio amateurs. I, they, I don't think my, the UK was my first DX, but it was always something special about contacting a G station. And uh, it, it's hard to describe, but it first of all, it was you know very clearly across the pond, almost the quintessential across the pond contact with us, for us. And uh, it the the G calls, and the the way the G station would communicate in in CW in Morse, it just in my twelve or thirteen year old mind, it, it conjured up. Images. I always had the picture of uh, a very dignified gentleman over at the other end, probably wearing a sweater, probably one of those sweaters with the you know the elbow pads, uh, smoking a pipe, having a, a hot cuppa right there in front of him, probably out in a really nice country cottage, just uh, sending me Morse code, and there I was communicating with Great Britain. It was just a, a wonderful feeling and there, there was something special about it. I mean, I guess the most thrilling DX experience that I had as a kid was when I uh, when I worked ZL2ACP. I uh, The first time I, I crossed the mighty Pacific and uh, that was that was really a big one, but there was something special about every one of those uh, those G contacts that I had. Um, Later on, um, much later on, when I found myself living in the Azores Islands of Portugal, um, we were there from 2000 to 2003. I was CU2JL, and one of the one of the really important uh, side benefits of being posted to the Azores was that I was almost exactly one ionospheric F zone skip to the United Kingdom. So as I look at my logbooks from that period, I see that a very high percentage of my contacts were with UK uh, radio amateurs, and that was that was great fun. It was almost I'm, I spent most of my time on 17 meters. We still had some sunspots at that point, so there was some some propagation, and it seemed like every time I turned on the uh, the radio, I was talking to a very congenial bunch of guys, most of whom, or many of whom anyway, were were from the UK. G3 IUE Morris out there in Penzance was uh, was one of the regulars, and and many others, and uh, it was just great fun. It, yeah, ironically, when I moved to London and inside the skip zone, and when I became a local, I, my the number of contacts that I had with um, with UK radio amateurs actually dropped off quite a bit. Um, we moved to the United Kingdom. We moved to London in uh, in 2003, and my employer, a, a well-known operation with with offices at Grosvenor Square, um, <laughs> decided that we needed to live in uh, we needed to live close to the embassy. So they they put us um, in a very posh neighborhood in uh, in South Kensington, Chelsea, in the Royal Borough. Which was uh, was great fun, and um, and we really really enjoyed our time there. My wife and the kids especially enjoyed living in that part of London. I I must say I was a bit disappointed at first, because as as do all true radio amateurs, when I got to the new location, I began immediately to look for signs of radio activity. I don't I don't mean like uranium. I mean you know amateur radio activity. I was looking around for antennas. Every once in a while I'd spot one, but then I'd discover that it was, you know, over the Bulgarian embassy or something, and it was not not one of ours. 
Um, or, you know, I even in the early days would spot a license plate that had what seemed to be a ham radio call sign. And I was disappointed to discover that uh, in most cases they were just random flukes of the, uh, of the, the UK <laughs> license plate system. Um, I even searched the stores. I looked around. I, I tried to find a store where I could buy components or, or magazines or something. And there was the odd Maplins or Maplins, but that was sort of a, it had become kind of a pale, uh, kind of weak substitute for uh, for Radio Shack, which was pretty pale and weak itself. Uh, but um, you could find all of the the Gucci handbags and all of the fine art and all of the antiques and all of the exotic foreign food you wanted. But I hate to say it, but in South Kensington and Chelsea, you couldn't find an electrolytic capacitor if your life depended on it. But hey, there were compensations, and, and it was just great to be in London and to be on the air from uh, from the UK. Um, the GQRP club was, was not really close. GQRP, GQRP club always seemed to be a bit to the north, but um, uh, I did have the opportunity to meet up, like I said, with club members at the rallies and things like that. You know, the UK is, in addition to those kind of early DX experiences, um, the UK has always been such an important part of the hobby for me and I think for most of my countrymen, I mean, in in the QRP world, uh, Sprat, a copy of which I have displayed right there, um, the GQRP club's uh, magazine is just just so important. I have my collection over there on the on the bookshelf, and I I've commented on the Solder Smoke podcast that um, I I I rarely leave the house without at least one or two copies of uh, of Sprat. Uh, stuck in my pocket. You never know. I mean, guys, be careful. Don't. I, I don't recommend leaving the house without a copy or two of Sprat because you know there are going to be those moments where your wife or daughter needs to go into the books into the the shoe store, and you're going to be out there on the high street. And I'm telling you, if you don't have a Sprat with you, it's uh, it's not pleasant. So so bring a copy of Sprat when you're when you're. Uh, uh, when your family members drag you off to the uh, to the shoe store, I really recommend it. Uh, the RSGB handbook, I have it over on the shelf also. It always seems to provide the kind of explanation or diagram that I'm looking for. I mean, it, it, it's really a wonderful pop, uh, publication. And I have to say something about another, uh, I, I think, real institution of the, of the UK amateur world, and that's... Uh, Pat Hawker, G3VA, and his his column, um, Technical Topics. I have purchased all of the compilations. I think there are all four of the compilations covering Pat's four decades of, of, of contribution to uh, amateur radio literature. And it's just a it's just a treasure for all of us. And uh, that's something else that I, I very often uh, grab and take with me as I'm, I'm heading out the door. And it never fails to provide the kind of reading that I'm looking for, the kind of ins information and inspiration that we all need as um, as radio amateurs and, and, and home brewers. So, <laughs> anyway, um, I think that should be the end of part two. Um, let's now um, take a pause and I'll put together part three.